of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ, faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Acts 16, beginning at verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of, up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord.
Once again, our text today for our meditation is Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 25. The account of the jailer at Philippi. Do you think we'll learn anything as a society after this year that has just gone by? Think we'll learn from all of the unrest that has taken place for all the past months? Think we'll learn from yesterday? People don't often learn from history, do they? Sometimes that's because they don't know it. And history is, is usually not the favorite subject in high school, is it? Is there anybody here who had history as your favorite subject? There's always a few. A couple? Otherwise, uh, it's generally the thing that kids tend to like least in, in grade school and in high school. Uh, somebody did this, somebody did this there, it happened then. Who was in Grant's tomb? When was the War of 1812? All these different facts you've got to learn and somehow keep in your head for a quiz. And what does that have to do with me right now in, in, in life? That's kind of the knock on history, isn't it? The things of the past are just things of the past. What do they have to do with us now? And sometimes all of those different facts, people are right about that, right? What do they really need to be known for? Sometimes they're wrong. Some events of history and the lessons of the past do affect us now, should be remembered. Some of the things that are happening now should be remembered in the generations to come. Nowhere is that more clear than the history of the Holy Scriptures. All that's going on this past year, all that happened yesterday, all the things that kind of weigh on us, and all the stuff that's going on with the pandemic, you know, all of these things they really do pale in importance compared to what happened a long time ago in biblical history. When God stepped into our world, when God took on human flesh, when he walked among us for our salvation, and all that he carried out in real time, in a real place in history, has everything to do with our life now, and it supersedes all of the other stuff that we think is really important. And more than just teaching us lessons, like history class is supposed to do in grade school and high school. The things that happened in the past, the things that our Lord Jesus did when he walked among us, are present blessings for us. They are not just facts that happened a long time ago that somehow teach us something now. They are with us. Today we have an event like that when we talk about the baptism of Christ. In the baptism of Christ, we have an event that probably only took just a very few minutes. And yet, it is a present blessing that stays with us, because in that moment, that's when our Lord Jesus begins his public ministry on our behalf. Now, we know that's true. With all of the things that happen in the scriptures, they are real things that happen for our salvation, that are with us now, and carry us into eternity. But let's let... Paul, and let's let the jailer at Philippi remind us of that fact that we already know. The baptism of Christ is a present blessing. So in the book of Acts, a history book, we read about Paul and Silas in jail. They're in the city of Philippi. Philippi is just north of Greece. Yugoslavia, oh, now I didn't know what it is now. I had to color it as Yugoslavia in grade school. Now it's a different couple nations. But it's right north of Greece, and Greece is still there like it's always been. Macedonia, it was called, I think it might be called that now again. And Paul and Silas are there by the Lord's very direction. Remember what was called the Macedonian call? When Paul had that vi vision, he was traveling around Turkey, place to place, Ephesus, Galatia, places like that. But he kept getting urged farther and farther to the coastline until he has this vision of someone saying, come over across and preach to us, the Macedonian call. And he crosses over the water and lands in Macedonia. The first place is Philippi. The first steps onto the continent of Europe from which most of us come with the gospel. By God's direction, there he is to preach the word to the Europeans. He meets Lydia. We still name people Lydia, don't we? One of the first converts in, in, in the European continent who helps 
be a base that forwards the mission of the gospel. But now he's in a jail cell in this very city. And for what? For preaching the gospel. And you can read it in Acts chapter 16, how it all happened. But he runs into some unscrupulous so-called businessmen, and you can read about how the preaching of the gospel affects their business of running this fortune teller. And these businessmen do what people seem to be able to do throughout history. They whip up a mob. They whip up a crowd. It's nothing new under the sun for people to be able to get groups of people to kind of get all whipped, whipped up to do what they want them to do. And the crowd ends up coming together as a mob. Paul and Silas end up beaten, arrested, flogged, and put in the jail cell. And there they are. And they're with unnamed prisoners, and they're with an unnamed jailer who's watching over the jail. What would you do if you were now in that spot? Because now they're in, a, they're in a difficult place. This is a dangerous situation. They're not living under some kind of godly government. Who is? They're living in, under the laws of the harsh Roman Empire. And Christianity is not a legal religion in their mind, one that they respected. Now they're in jail. What would be all going through your mind? Just picture yourself now. Beaten, flogged, mob has thrown you into jail. What's going to happen next? Is it fear? Panic? Frustration? At the unfairness of everything? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Does it get to like Adam finally got when he said, the woman you put here, God, tempted me and I ate the fruit. Blaming God for, God, you're the one that, that brought me here with that Macedonian call. I'm supposed to be here in Philippi. I'm doing your work. I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm preaching your word for crying out loud. And now I'm in jail. Anger? I think all of those things might have crossed my mind. Here's how Paul and Silas react. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. That's how he reacted. Beaten and bloody and unfairly treated in a jail that could not be like the little country club we call our Jefferson County Jail, which is so nice compared to some, and certainly so much nicer than this one. The unfairness, coupled with the serious pain and discomfort, an unknown future, and there he's singing hymns, praying and joyful and talking to other prisoners. What could cause him to act that way? The very message that he was sharing with these men, that Paul and Silas were sharing with each other. The work of Christ on their behalf the deeds, the words, the actions, the sacrifice, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus that all took place historically on a different day and place than where they were sitting right now. And that knowledge that Jesus had come and, and had lived and died for them <clears throat> eternally made the future okay no matter what was going to happen and the promise that he is surely with them always at the very end of the age made the present bearable for them and that's the message that they were sharing. It's the gospel, isn't it? That could bring joy. The work of Jesus on their behalf. And that all began publicly at that moment in time in history at the baptism of Christ. Jesus had been fulfilling God's law all along since he was born, right? Active obedience of Jesus, right? Actively serving. I'm pointing at the confirmation case. We just, just it. we just talked about that today. Jesus actively had been living perfectly. Right, twelve years old in the temple, fulfilling God's law perfectly for us, respecting his parents, living and growing. But publicly, he begins his ministry at his baptism. John was outside baptizing in the Jordan River. So now we start reading the gospel accounts about the baptism of Christ. John didn't want to do it. Do you remember why? 
We know, we're told, that John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people were coming out there and trusting in the Lord and in that baptism, being given and, and strengthened in that gift of faith and cleansing that comes from faith in God and the promise of the Savior. Well, here the Savior stands. And John knows why he's out there baptizing people for, for repentance and forgiveness of sins. But Jesus had no sins to repent of. Jesus had no reason to be cleansed. So he doesn't want to do it. And if we read one of the other gospel accounts, it says that Jesus pushed back on John's argument. This is what he said. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then Jesus was baptized by John. He consents because Jesus said so. It is proper for me to stand here with these people because I've come to take their place in life and in death. And the heavens open, and, and as Jesus is being baptized, the Spirit visibly comes down upon him. A visible anointing with the Spirit, you could say, in the form of a dove. And a voice comes from heaven, this is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. At the baptism of Jesus, everybody publicly sees that he is the great anointed one, the Messiah that was to come, the Christ. He came to stand in the place of sinners. He came to fulfill all righteousness, to do it all right where you and I didn't. He came on a mission of salvation that would not be ended until his crucifixion, his punishment of hell being laid upon his shoulders, the passive obedience to his Father's will as death and hell is laid upon him. And he steps out of that empty tomb. And all of this is in Paul's mind as he sits in that jail cell and he talks to the prisoners. He, it can even bring him joy. Well, you remember what happened next. And sure, you can explain things by natural phenomenon if you want. There's always um, earthquakes, they say, over in that area, Greece and uh, Turkey. They get that a lot, just like California does. But nothing happens by accident under God's rule of his world for the good of his people. Nothing happens by accident. What God allows, even the evil of people, if he allows it, he allows it. What God allows to come, even the evils of a virus, if he allows it, he allows it. Nothing happens that isn't finally, in the end, going to serve God's purposes. And an earthquake comes, and the jail cell breaks open. It's in the middle of the night. What a perfect chance of escape. I might have thought about that. I wonder if Paul did too. He might have rationalized it. You know what, I, I could do more gospel work if I walk right out of these doors now. Maybe this is a sign from God. The cell just opened. But he didn't. He stayed. Paul and Silas both stayed. Unfairly treated as they were, their Christian scruples still wouldn't allow them maybe to walk away. Not just them. The fellows they were talking to stayed. The gospel has the power, doesn't it, to, to touch even the hardest of hearts, to cleanse even the worst of sins, to turn around lives that are extremely on the wrong track. The gospel's done that all for us. And these unnamed prisoners, they stay. Meanwhile, the jailer wakes up and he sees all of this in the dark. And he pulls out his sword because he's going to kill himself. Think of the fear that grips this man. He works for the Roman government. He knows what kind of brutality they're capable of. He's a jailer. He's seen it all. And he doesn't want to get in trouble. The fear of punishment to the point of there's nothing left to live for. He's ready to kill himself. But it's got to be worse than that, doesn't it? At that moment in time, what happens after death? Doesn't that have to go through his mind too? That terror of the afterlife and he doesn't know but he's going to do it until Paul and Silas say stop we're all here and that life and death moment and that sudden terror suddenly switched to it's okay we're all here all of that suddenness causes him to ask the ultimate question which everybody finally has to ask sirs what must I do to be saved he had to have been listening to Paul all this time. He didn't have his transistor radio. That's a little radio, kids, that um, goes like this and you hold it and it tunes in. 
works kind of similar to an iPod music comes out of it. He didn't have all of that. They don't even have iPods anymore. <laughs> all right. What's he going to do besides listen to the Word of God? Being talked about in the background. It has an effect, doesn't it? The Word and the lives of Christians have an effect. And this man sees it. And he asks, what must I do to be saved? Paul once called himself the chief of sinners for his persecution and his leading people away from the gospel. This man was on the brink of death, not only the brink of death, the brink of hell. And he knew it. He knew it. And for both Paul and for this man, what's the solution? The work of Christ on their behalf. The fact that God so loved the world that he sent his son, that he sent a savior who lived perfectly and died and rose again. What a thrill it must have been for Paul to think about Christ himself, but then to realize, now I know why the Lord has put us here in this unfair, seemingly situation. To talk to this man who just asked, what must I do to be saved? What a joy it must have been. I don't know if it was Paul who said it or Silas, because we're just told that they said it. And I'm sure they talked a lot more. They reply, easiest answer ever, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Our little students learn it right away, don't they? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes will not perish. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He became one of us. He took our place to fulfill all righteousness where we had not been righteous. He took our guilt and sin upon himself in our place. He suffered and died and rose again. Believe, jailer, in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And it didn't stop with the jailer. I don't know if he lived at the jail. I don't know what he did with the other prisoners, if he had to go down the street to get to his house. I'm guessing probably that was all probably one big complex. But here, these bloody, beaten, tired guys that... Paul and Silas, he, he washes up their wounds, he takes them into his own house, introduces them to his wife. Who did you bring home now? I'm sure she said, now what are you bringing these guys in here for? But the wife, the children, all are listening to the gospel. The whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God, and they also were baptized. And it didn't end there. The book of Acts is an unfinished book. If you ever read the history book in, in Acts, it keeps, the spread of the gospel keeps going, keeps going. It just kind of ends. It doesn't even have a conclusion. It doesn't even have a wrap-up statement. It just keeps, because the story keeps going. The Holy Christian Church continues to be extended by the power of the Spirit. As Jesus extended it, Paul says in another place, that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Jesus has done this for us. When he stood in that river and was baptized so long ago, he stood in our place. That is a present blessing that's always with us. Jesus has stood in our place in life and in death and is our perfect sacrifice. And that truth never goes away. And we are the ones who have been cleansed, washed, are considered blameless and without stain or wrinkle in his sight. God has connected us to Christ. Guess how? In our baptisms, which connects us to the work of Jesus. He has placed all of Jesus' work into our baptism. How long ago was it for each of you? Longer than you can remember, right? You don't even remember it happening as I'm looking at everybody. But God has connected you to him. Your baptism is a present blessing. I don't remember mine either, but God remembers it. He remembers me. He knows my sin. He knows my life. He knows my worries, my fears, my future. He is with me. He is with you, and he knows your name and all of those things about you too. Your baptism is a present blessing because it connects you to Jesus and what he has done in the past, and that too is a present blessing. Next time you feel like Paul, and you feel like the chief of sinners, and the weight of your guilt is pressing hard. Remember how he found his joy in what Jesus had done for him. Next time you feel like Paul, 
and maybe feel like the world is treating you unfairly and you don't know why you're in this situation or that, remember that you are connected to Jesus who said he will never leave nor forsake. The next time you even have a tinge of fear about your own death or mortality, maybe even about the afterlife, Remember the fear of the jailer, but remember also the great joy that came to him and to his family because he too was connected with Jesus. History. The baptism of Jesus happened at just a few moments time, a long time ago in a faraway place. But it is a present blessing for us. Jesus is always a present blessing. He took our place. And as the jailer found out, as Paul knew, as we all know, because of him, we will join him, right, in his place. Let that present blessing give you joy in the midst of whatever surrounds. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace.